Hello, it's Sandy and Jeremiah, and we are back uh, discussing the story of Jesus's journey to Calvary. And in this episode, we're going to walk through uh, Jesus's crucifixion, what happened in Calvary or at Calvary. We're going to discuss his burial and how he was prepared and laid in the tomb. We'll also talk about the resurrection and the fact that Mary found that the tomb was empty. Uh, and we'll discuss what happened next and his various appearances after the resurrection. So we're wrapping up the story uh, of Jesus's earthly life through this episode. It'll be awesome. What do you think, Jeremiah? I'm excited for this. It's also as, as we were doing the prep for this, uh, it is interesting of consuming all of these uh, gospels about this event and realizing some of the pieces that I think fall away from our normal telling of these things and how much they stood out to me this time and also how uncomfortable some of these pieces are, but illuminating. Uh, so I'm excited to go through this, but also knowing it's a little, it's a little weird at times. It's a very big story. And we discussed this, how among the four gospels, the telling of this story, these stories is pretty detailed mm -hmm. and each of the four included details that maybe one or two of the others did not. And so we have this unique source material that some of them are using and then common source material, eyewitness accounts. Uh, but it just ends up being a very big story and it's be very difficult to walk through it exactly step by step because there's so much information. Um, but we are starting with the crucifixion. We've already mm -hmm. covered in the last podcast the, the trial and his uh, pilot condemning him to death. Um, and that is a sad story. And the sad story continues, continues now. We're still at what I would call a low point in this story. <clears throat> As we walk through the story in John's gospel, uh, that's where I'm going to start. He tells us about that he was handed over to the soldiers. So now it's the soldiers, the Roman soldiers' responsibility to get Jesus where he needed to be uh, at Calvary with the, what he needed to have, which was the cross. Uh, and he had to carry his own cross. We don't know whether this is actually the entire cross or just the bar that sits on top of the cross. But we can imagine that this is uh, a very heavy thing and he is already extremely wounded and weary about what has happened in that morning. This is also all sleep deprived. At, right. Sleep deprived. But it's interesting that the Gospels don't focus that much on his physical pain. Uh, I just wanted to bring that out. That's a lot of times we see in movies where there's all this flogging and torture but it's um they're not focusing on that hmm. like how how he hurt he was as he went to the cross more like really more like his determination to do it to go why there. do you think that is well if i were to ask your opinion on that i i don't know whether they're trying they're trying to protect us or shield us from the amount of suffering he went through or whether they're thinking that's not the point of the story. The point is not necessarily the suffering. The point is more the death and mm -hmm. then the resurrection. But I know in, in culture, there's a lot of emphasis placed on that, right? Like right. what actually happened to him physically. Uh, but perhaps they thought, well, ultimately he did die on that cross. And that's what's most important to point out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's also interesting that era brutality was, I think, just more common, right? I mean, you go look through any of Jewish history and what happened to them and like, was it the Sumerians? Some of the things that they did to like flay people alive and all that, like it also could it be, it just didn't stand out to them the way that it does us. Yeah. Well, crucifixion was a common, a common death for people sentenced to die. So they... Mm -hmm had seen quite a bit of it or were around it. Anytime you were in Jerusalem, you would walk by the rows of people who were crucified 
by the Roman government. <clears throat> so, yeah, it definitely was trying to send a message when mm -hmm. they walked by those. And perhaps the gospel writers didn't really want to tie it into that message. Hmm. Um, I like that thought a lot. Possibly. <clears throat> So they take him up to Calvary and they put him on the cross and nail him to the cross. Uh, and then they have this kind of odd scene of the soldiers there vying for his what's left of his physical remains of earth, like his cloak and his tunic. Um, but also we see them placing a sign above Jesus's head. And, and what did that sign say? So, uh, King of the Jews, which there's a very unique little back and forth about that sign, uh, with Pilate and the religious leaders that I, I don't know if I'd noticed that prior to this. <clears throat> well, walk us through that. What happened? So, um, in all the gospel accounts, they all very clearly record. There's this sign above Jesus, Jesus, King of the Jews, or maybe just King of the Jews. Um, and I think it's in John's account. You have to forgive me that I don't remember which one. Uh, there's this little story about how uh, the religious leaders, I'm assuming it's uh, Caiaphas coming up. Hey, you can't do that. Don't, don't, don't call him that. And uh, Pilate says, what I have said, I have said, or what I have written, I have written. I have and written, it feels written, like written. it's a thumb back at them or like, you're making me do this. So I get to, like a reminder of who's somewhat in power of this situation. It's really power wild. Too. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. Now you could take that many different ways. Like pilots kind of like pushing back on them. Like, no, like that's his charge. I'm putting this here as this thing. It could be pilot making fun of him, which is what I've kind of believed before. But again, seeing all the accounts, pilot seems very reluctant to do this act in my current yes. reading of this. And also he gets this weird message from his wife and one of the stories of, right. Hey, stay away from this guy. I just had a, a dream that I've been dealing with, which is again, just speaks to the supernatural nature of every piece of this story. And so I don't know if that's like a pressure relief valve, the pilot hit of like, no, I'm going to do what I'm going to do here. Or if it's him wrestling with this, I don't know, but it's, it's, Another yeah, piece of like the it's power like he's story. Mad. He's mad that they applied this pressure on him because we don't see him clearly thinking Jesus is guilty. Um, we see him going back and forth, but then ultimately putting his own uh, career f front and center. Like, I'm just going to get rid of the guy so it doesn't become a bigger problem. But I'm going to thumb my nose at the religious authorities, as you said. Uh, I think what's interesting about the sign is the truth of it. And for all times, there it is uh, above him on the cross, the king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, could you imagine being a religious leader either uh, that had something to do with this or like, let's say a relative of that religious leader, knowing that they trumped up these charges against Jesus, knowing they, they conspired to have him executed and then to see the one thing they didn't want known about him is in every telling of the story. I mean, that yes. it's like you lost. You didn't work. Oh, yeah. You wanted there it is, to. They had no victory in any of this. Mm. I like the fact that, you know, he's born a king. He dies a king and he's resurrected mm -hmm. a king. So this idea that he's a king was true from the beginning of time. Hmm. And this unwitting uh, person, Pontius Pilate, just confirms it because he's mad at the Jewish authorities. So God's right. will and be you, done. Well, and there's these moments where it feels like that the centurions or the guards, I may be using the, 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 the term improperly, like after Jesus passes away, like even the, the Romans are like, oh my gosh, he was the son of God. Now, yeah. I don't think with their worldview of their pantheon panathes um i'm drawing the blank on the word they believed in multiple gods right they had a very different right. structure of how they saw the world yeah but i feel like all of them at a certain point everybody in the story had to come to a moment of like oh he was god i mean even if you go back to judas judas betrayed him but then oh, yeah. goes back and says i've I don't know. Maybe he didn't realize that they were going to crucify him because he's like, I've, I've, I've got innocent blood on my hands. 
Right. Like kind of like he hadn't thought about that yet. And then kind of like he realized, oh my gosh, no, it is the son of God. So everybody throughout the story, I think, has to come to terms with this and they have to land that. And I think that's Pilate's way of, mm-hmm. no, this is son of God. Now, I think that meant something very different to a, some, a Roman uh, than a Jewish person. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I love the fact that throughout the story, there's these eye opening moments, right? Like we see mm-hmm. that as a common theme. We see uh, this the centurion, his eyes being opened. We see the prisoner next to him who's hanging on the other cross. His eyes are open. We see that happen with the men on the road uh, after his resurrection. We see it happen with Mary when Jesus calls her name, Mary. This whole eye-opening thing about what actually happened versus what did we think happened. Mm. Uh, There's the human thinking of it, and then there's God's part of it. And to that point, I do like the thought that Jesus was in control of the timing of all of this. Like He literally said, I lay down my life, and I pick my life back up again. Nobody had control or authority over what happened to Jesus. Only Jesus had control over what happened to him. The, only God, the Father, and Jesus were in control of what happened, including the timing of this event, because you know the event starts still very early on um, Friday morning after the trial. Mm-hmm. Then there's the whole, you know, he's he's condemned to die. Then they take him out to Golgotha and he's hung on the cross. And there at his feet are a bunch of Marys. There's several Marys there. There's Hard to keep track mother, of them. Yeah. There's a lot of Marys. Uh, there's the mother of Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the wife of Clopas, who we've never heard of before or after, and Salome, Mary's sister. So, and, um, that's Mary's sister and the cousin and, and her sons are John and James. Um, so they're Jesus's cousins. So he turns to John, um, his cousin, his friend, his apostle. And what does he say to him? He's from the cross. He says, basically take care of Mary. Yeah. She's yours now. I love that. He designates somebody to care for her. Mm-hmm. But interesting, it's not one of his siblings. Yeah, I was confused by that same thought as well. Why wasn't one of his siblings? And also, it, he clearly wasn't caring for her because he was on the road, right? I mean, he could have been caring for her up till he started his ministry, but then he was gone for three years. I mean, coming back and forth, it does, by the phrase that these group of women followed him to take care of his needs, was his mother following him through all of these adventures? I don't, I don't think so, because we so see various points some... where she shows up to see mm-hmm. how he is or what's going on. And, and so, again, so she had she was her. being taken care of. And was he given her resources by proxy that he, I, mean, I found that all I have to say is I don't have any answers there. I found that very interesting of take care of her. Joseph is gone. Right. We know that. Um was he, I don't know, it, it stood out to me. And why, out of, again, as we, we discover of all these stories, certain pieces were archived. Why? Yeah. And we know that whether it was a lot was not written about what happened. Right. And so I think, and I don't think that that was like conspiratorial or just like, if hey, if I'm going to write you an email, or if I'm going to call you on the phone, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you a lot because I got to tell you what I got to tell you. Right. How do you like that for eloquence? Um, I I really have never experienced you that way, so I really don't even know what you're talking about. (laughs) She's like, oh, no, here's another 45-minute phone call about the most pedantic thing ever. Um, Um, No, So why was that a piece that they chose to write in there about his mom? And maybe, I I don't know. Well, I think it's it's just his loving nature, right? Hmm. Like, Okay. Several of his siblings do come to believe in him. We know this is true because two of his brothers write books in the New Testament. So we can assume, I think we can safely assume that most of them, if not all of them, came to believe, but not at that very moment. So Mm -hmm. at that very moment, he's looking to his cousin 
take care of my mom. Hmm. I love how it actually is a human question. It's a human request. Like, please take care of my mom. Um, right. So, so hold on. So I, you just passed over some that I find interesting. I just want to make sure I heard you right. Or if this is what you meant to say, you, uh, you feel like the cousins were not in a crisis of faith moment where maybe the siblings and other people were. And so he handed it off to the people that were believing in that moment. Is that yes, what you said? That believed in him. Yeah. I like that. I haven't, I, that's good. I like that. What do you know? We are like exploring new things. <laughs> right. Right. I like it too. And I like, well, every mother likes to think their son wants to take care of him. So we're easily <laughs> bought into that idea that that was what yeah. his goal was. Um, but, uh, Again, when we look at the timeline, because I like timelines, he is hung on the cross around noon, and then there's this darkness that overtakes the land. It's dark from noon to three, and he dies at three. That's about that's the, the time that two of the Gospels tells us that that's when he died. Um, it could be all three of them said that. Darkness covered the land between noon and three. And what happened at three in the temple? I know you like this part of the story. Something physical happens in the right. temple. So the veil, oops, sorry. Um, the veil uh, was split. And the veil was split. I will let you talk more. Oh, no, I really like your question. Way. I like your question about what happens to the veil. I want you to pose that question. So there's a few things that I have there. I'm not quite sure which one you're referencing. Um, so we know that there was two temples, right? One temple was destroyed and they rebuilt it. And you told me that your thoughts would be God never inhabited the second temple like he did the first, right? right. Well, after the Babylonians, no. After, uh, so the yeah. veil was there more as a symbol than an actual mechanism now. And then that yes. was ripped to kind of... A, it feels like a great metaphor. I, I think we take that as, oh, God's everywhere now. Um, yeah. But I almost wonder if it was more of a metaphor of like what you think about this is no can no longer be, right? Um, I, I love so, that thought. Like right in the heart of the temple, tearing apart the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. One allowed your mind to does wander. Does send a message, doesn't it? It said, well, allow your mind to wander for a second. So here's these people that we have established through great detail, how they are essentially trying to protect their way of life. And the foundation of their way of life is the temple. And here comes this event that part of your, your temple is disfigured or changed, however you want to say it. It's the whole thing you were trying to avoid. And then also I wonder how common knowledge was it that this had happened? And then if it was common knowledge, how did they, how did Caiaphas process that? Because actually we'd never, we never hear of Caiaphas again, right? We never. Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, maybe an ax. I, so I wouldn't want to say for sure that we never hear of him again. But there they is have to deal with this story. reality of yeah. here's this thing that's proven that, that if that veil is not there, the entire purpose of the, the temple is gone, right? Am I overstating well, that? I don't it's, know. It's not that it's the entire purpose, but it's one of the most symbolic, if not the most symbolic things in the temple, items in the temple is separating man from God. Right. That only mm -hmm. once a year did the high priest get to go into that room. Mm -hmm. And and I think you were right that they used to tie a rope around him in case uh, something happened to get him well, out of there. You have to go back and listen to our Christmas stuff to see that little interaction. <laughs> but the point is that of all the things that you could destroy in the temple to send a message like you're God and I'm I'm sending a message to you about what just happened. How fascinating that that's what he chose to have happen, to tear that veil. Um, and the question that you had asked before, which I thought was interesting, is did they fix it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Did they fix the veil? Yeah. I mean, they would have to, right? I mean. Because so the temple stood for another 50 curtain, years like or something, right? 
let's assemble, let's, let's assume it's a tapestry. So it's a big, heavy tapestry that's quite ornate. Mm-hmm. So they have to send in somebody to sew it back together. Uh, I don't know. You think it would have rattled, rattled them to the core that that happened. If they really believed or had it become just a thing, you know, and well, I, and, how, and, and it's, how do you it's just, hard to know. How do you explain it to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees well, and every other priest? How do you explain? Oh, it just randomly tore at the same moment that Jesus died. I think that we all believe what we want to believe, right? Yes. We don't deal with facts well as a species. We we <laughs> take away whatever we want, right? A yes. blo- broken clock's right twice a day. It could be like, well, that's just weird, whatever. And also, how many of these people were still people of faith or were they people of a system? And 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 we can see through the stories there's both of them because later there's this character, Joseph, that comes out that was one of them that it mentions he believed and he was, did not approve of what happened. So it's not like this whole group is in a One big group. Yeah. And so there, but how many people like a Caiaphas and his father-in-law that again, as we talked about, that felt more mafia power struggle to me than people that yeah. were really of faith. Now I could be, I don't want to judge these, these folks inappropriately. Right. It's, it's hard to know what was, they felt 2000 years ago, but you know, did they really believe God was behind this veil or is it just like, Hey, here's the traditions we've had and down. Now it's our way of living. We have to protect this, but well, I think either they did way feel they have like a, a reckoning. Yeah. Uh, you said that you think they felt like he was there. Yeah. But they had no evidence of that. Whereas before there was evidence. So, so but you think Caiaphas no- honestly believed that? I think it was more leaning towards we have to save the temple because it was one of the three pillars of their faith, temple, Torah, and the land. Those were the three pillars of the Jewish faith. And if Mm -hmm. any of those are threatened, like we're going to take away the temple, which might also include taking away your land, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to, they're going to do what they think it takes as we would. Yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with that thought because I think had they had faith in God, I don't know if they could have executed God's son. Well, yeah, had they considered it to be true. I mean, lied and manipulated the things to have Jesus executed. I, I, I don't think that they – I think it just moved to a mechanism for them rather than a – true faith and we see that yeah. all throughout scripture because uh, it, it, it's a cycle that happens over and over again and oh yeah i think any of it us happened can, in the old it, testament a lot absolutely and i think any of us in our life that have had faith for a while there's times where the faith grows dim and the mechanism of i go to church more because i like sunday dinner or sunday lunch rather than church right like it's just those it's more of an you institution. should fight a different church if you feel that way for sure, for sure. But I think we all have found our moments like that, right? Sure. Um, yeah. So I don't want to belabor this point more than we already have. But yeah, the veil rips. Everybody veil that's rips. watching this, think about that and let us know what you think about that. Because that, that it seems like it's just this quick little piece. But all of a sudden, if you go put together what you know about this veil and what you know about the circumstances, that seems pretty dramatic. I mean, I completely agree. So after Jesus dies, uh, let's move on to the next part. Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, he goes to Pilate and says, may I take the body down? He has to have permission because it has to be documented that Jesus is dead. And this is one of those places where If you're trying to be a conspiracy theorist and say that he wasn't dead, absolutely not. The Romans would have certified and been certain that he was dead before they gave the body over to anybody. That's just common practice, right? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't want somebody being taken off the uh, cross who was just really in bad shape. And then you take them off and you go heal them up. Right. That, that wouldn't that would, be effective. Be, you can't have people walking around saying, I survived 
crucifixion. No. Um, well, there's there's no. there's also prior to that, there's a little nuance I'd, I'd like to dive into very quickly. Although I don't know if we do anything quickly. Um, <laughs> they go and decide the, the, the Jewish leaders are like, they want this wrapped up because it's the day of preparation. You hear about this day of preparation all throughout this. Like, and, and that's because it's the day before the Sabbath. So they need to, when the sun sets, they need to no longer be working. So they, what they had to wait until the sun set on Saturday. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, so the, the, they, they, Pilate says, go, I think it's Pilate that says, go break their legs, right? Because then they can no longer support themselves. They'll suffocate, suffocate. Now, Jesus is already dead. And he's like, really? He's kind of surprised to know that Jesus had already died. And they pierced him with a spear. Um, but one thing that, that one of the, the gospels say is that his legs weren't broken because it, it, it was prophesied that he would not have any broken bones, what yes. a, another bizarre piece of information interjected in this story. So back to the conspiratorial, conspiratorial thing, like there's many pieces that can point back to we knew he was dead. How do we know he was dead, right? Pilate, there was this clarification inside the story of Pilate's like, oh, really? He's dead already? Okay. Yeah. They pierce him with a spear. Everything's the water and the blood spill out, right? Um, uh the he, uh, uh, Joseph goes and asks for the body. They had to know right. that he was dead to hand over the body. So yes, I, I think there's many pieces there, and also it, it points back to this prophecy, which is just wild to me. Well, there's several places where they point back to prophecy, and remember we we kind of brushed over it, but we'll talk about it that they didn't fully understand what had happened until after he was resurrected. And then they went back and they looked through the Torah Mm -hmm. and they saw the prophecies and they connected those to Jesus. Um, So like even when they're dividing his clothes, that is related to Psalm, uh, it's Psalm 22. And that Psalm is said to be exactly the story of Jesus and what happened to him at Golgotha. And part of it is this message around they took his, they cast lots to take his clothes. So they're now coming back when they're writing it and tying it into the prophecies that had come before that are tied to Jesus. And that makes perfect sense to me because that's what they would be wanting people to see and base everything on, not just their word, right? Absolutely. So again, they, they, He's, he's dead. I think his suffering is short, three hours, relative to how others' suffering can be in that. Um, Joseph shows up and says, I, I want to take the body. He's a secret disciple of Jesus. He's not out there saying, I am a follower, because he's afraid uh, of his social status and of being found out that. You kind of wonder how many of the Jewish people did believe in him secretly. Mm-hmm. Um, even today, we have a lot of Christians who have to believe secretly because of the ramifications for their life. Um, anyway, so in John's gospel, they take the body and 75 pounds of spices to a burial place, which is uh, thought of as Joseph's family tune had not been used. And they labor by wrapping up his body with these spices together with the linens. And I don't know if it was spices first and then linens or a mixture of it all together. But we know they're kind of in a hurry because it's almost the Sabbath. So they're they're doing the work, but it may not be exactly the kind of burial scenario you would have if the Sabbath wasn't coming and Passover. Um, so on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, Monday, I'm Sunday morning, we move on to what happens there. And on Monday morning, Mary comes to the tomb very early in the morning. And which Mary is this? Magdalene. Okay. Which Mary is it? It's really, it's really, it's a valid question. I find myself kind of, of wandering that a lot. Like, wait, 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 is this, no, it's not as well. Okay. 
<laughs> well, then we throw this Mary, the wife of Clopas, in there, and she, we've never heard of her or hear from her again. So let's add to the Mary confusion while we're at it. Mm -hmm. So Mary shows up, uh, and the tomb is open. Now, when she first looks in there, all she sees, oh, no, just the tomb is open. So she's I, I kind of want to, right? yeah, so she's spooked by the rock is gone. The rock is gone. So she runs back to where Peter and John are, where the disciples are. So now I get this picture that they're holed up somewhere in Jerusalem or around Jerusalem. So after his arrest, they didn't scatter to the winds. They kind of stayed in the area. But they're certainly freaking out or sad or confused. Well, and didn't Probably they all have to because of the Sabbath? Like they weren't allowed to walk more than a certain distance, right? I mean, I think that's a fair, a very fair assessment that they had to hold up for the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. So she runs it. I love, by the way, I just want to mention, I love the fact that the first one to see that the tomb is empty is a woman because <clears throat> I do like the overturning of power structures that Jesus brings to us, um, the equalizing of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Peter and John then rush back it to the tomb and Peter looks in first and he sees, what does he see in there? He sees the linens, the strips of linen, but the head covering is more like rolled in a ball and put hmm. separately. Um, uh, but they still don't understand the significance of what they're seeing, right? They're still right. like, what the heck happened? And, um, yeah, she then is sitting there. They leave. They they leave to go back to tell the others. She's still there, and she's she's crying. She's she's wailing. Uh, she's so upset, and she looks in the tomb finally, and she sees two angels. So, what should we assume or think about the angels being there? Kind of an interesting question. So there's a ton here and we could spend <laughs> a lot of time talking about it. so one i get the thing like she's she's crying and she's wailing because i think she feels somebody stole his body yeah. and also you go back to prior why were these women here Be, the story tells us earlier these women followed jesus around and took care of him took care of his needs i think is the phrase that's used at least in the version that i read so even back to the, the whole power structure hierarchy, it wasn't men that were taking care of Jesus. It was women, right? And so you can take like his ministry would have been possible without these women supporting him. So if you just want to well, look I, at the I whole- I say amen to that for sure. The whole picture is really cool there, right? So mm -hmm. now these women are still there because they took care of him, right? They, they, they have the different bond with him than the disciples do, right? And then to somebody to steal the body, like, could you imagine like you bury a loved one and then you come back and the body's gone? Like how heartbreaking, right? Then they encounter the angels of like, basically he's, he's alive. I, I don't remember exactly what they yeah. said. What, what did they, oh, what did the angels uh, tell them specifically? Said, he says, um, the first questions, why are you crying? It's a really interesting question. Like, like, are like, the angels no thinking, well, how come you don't realize what's happening? Are the angels being a bit unkind to her? Like, why are you crying? Duh, he's alive. Uh, why, why wouldn't you say something like, you don't need to cry or mm -hmm. you, you know, there's no need for your tears. Or maybe that's what they're saying. Like, why are you crying? This is a, an amazing sure. thing that's happened, but she hasn't seen Jesus yet. Just the no. angels. Well, I think any time in scripture we we well, and also there is in one of the at least the versions, it is when they see the angels. What do the angels say? Don't do be not afraid. be afraid. <laughs> right again, we see yeah. this pattern that we go back to the Christmas story every time they're there. Do not be afraid. We don't right. know who these angels are, right? So that's kind of interesting because we knew that uh, uh, Gabriel was mentioned before. This does not appear to be Gabriel. Uh, I found yeah. that interesting. But still, do not be afraid. And then I think anytime in, in, in we see people interacting with the supernatural, 
the supernatural always appears to have a different level of knowledge and understanding than yes. we do. Right. And it's yeah. almost like what's going like they, 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 uh, the supernatural is always a bit perplexed as to why we don't get it. Jesus does this all the time. Like, what do you mean you don't understand? This is so simple. Yeah. And you're like, I don't get it. So I take it more <laughs> as that of like, like what, don't you get it? I mean, like, how can you not get it? How can you not see this is what everything's been built for was this moment. I, I love how they're there present there and they must be attending to Jesus or had been doing something. You have a theory about what they were doing, right? Your yeah, theory my is- theory for sure. So we only have one other example of a person being in a tomb raised from the dead, and it's Lazarus, right? Of what started this whole thing, right? Was Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And what is the sequence of events? So he, uh, Jesus tells people to roll the stone away, which they're like, the sisters are like, no, he's going to smell. He's been dead for a while. It's like, roll the stone away. Then he does. And then Lazarus is maybe up and about something like that. And he says, go take off his death clothes, go unwrap him. Right. Cause there, as we just talked about, uh, um, Joseph and apparently Nicodemus, prepared the body, wrapped him up, did this standard burial tradition. So now we take the story that we know of, of Lazarus, of how that un- transpired. People had to roll the stone away and people had to um, take his death clothes off. Who did that in this story? If we were to take it from what we know, we would have to assume the angels did. Now it could be that, an earthquake rolled the stone away. It could be that Jesus, it, he wasn't paired properly because they had to go so fast and the, the linens were loose and he was able just to, there, there's many ways. But again, my theory would be because of the specific, how similar these stories are and the two angels are there. My theory would be the angels rolled the stones away and the angels unwrapped Jesus, which then is, you take that and you think about that. It's a very, at least for me, a very uncomfortable thought because again, the the idea of how much supernatural actually physically interacting with our world is always it's just uncomfortable for me to think about. Well, you don't always hear the stories the way they're so highlighted here, the supernatural. Mm-hmm. So it's harder for us to feel like it's happening all the time, but it, it most definitely is hmm. around the world uh, in various places at various times, miracles happen all the time. And that's a supernatural occurrence, but it's kind of interesting to point out that when Jesus was resurrected, his body was not the same. He didn't have a purely human form anymore. And so uh, he was a bit different And, you know, there again, when Mary looks up and there's a person there, she doesn't recognize him as Jesus. Right. Which I find is interesting. And Um, and most most of these stories, that's a common thread of it takes them a second. Now, sometimes it says they were blocked or blinded from knowing, but there's something different for sure. Something is different. And she doesn't realize it's Jesus until he says her name. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. I think about that. Like that's a big, the voice recognition. I kind of think about that along with the story of the shepherd. I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. Mm -hmm. And here's an example of that. It's she's one of his sheep, one of his followers, and she recognizes his voice. She knows it's him because of his voice and that's powerful to me because I feel like I know Jesus because of his voice of what I read. Mm. I've never seen him right um, in person. Well, I, I, I think if you, if you think about how many times you're like in a public space and you hear all this chatter and you can't tell voices, but then all of a sudden you hear your name and that, yeah, it, it, it strikes you. And specifically if it's a child of yours or a friend of yours or a loved one, a parent of yours, a loved one, like just th- that makes you feel something very strong in that moment. And when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I know that feeling. I know what it's like to be, you know, picking your kid up from school and all of a sudden you hear 
that one voice call your name and it's like, Oh, that's my kids. Or a well, parent he had already spoken to her. I mean, he'd already said something to her. Absolutely. But you don't, that's, not, that's I guess what I'm trying to, the, the, the picture I'm trying to paint of if you're in some of these spaces or you hear voices, you're not always like attuned, but with the second they say your name that crystallizes, Oh my gosh, that's that person. Right. I mean, that's a good, a good thing to, to point out that it was her name uh, that caught her attention, mm -hmm. but it still is a little surprising. She's looking right up at him and he speaks to her. It wasn't until she, till he calls her name. Um, but in any case, she then leaves and, and uh, runs off to tell the disciples the news. I love this too, that she says she's the first one to have seen the resurrected Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and shares the, the news with his disciples. Um, and so now later on that day. And they didn't believe her at first. Yeah. I, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, there's definitely, I, oh, they said something that definitely said, to our modern ear sounds a little sexist. Of like, it's just some woman, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> But then they're yeah. curious enough that they go follow her. Um, at least uh, Peter does and um, uh, John. there's one other, John. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then they see the linens are there, but I, I don't think that they still believed because I think Peter is even like, what does this mean? Yeah, it doesn't sound like they stuck around in John's version to see the resurrected Christ. Like they saw the empty tomb and the linens and they bolted back to tell the other disciples. But then Mary comes back and says, I've actually seen him resurrected. <clears throat> and they're very shocked at that, maybe not believing. And Thomas is not there when that happens. Right. Um, and we don't fully know he, which ones are and aren't there. We don't fully know. But we know they're there that night. So they're there that Sunday night. And this is the first appearance when he shows up in their midst and they're behind a locked door. Like mm -hmm. They're hiding out still. Uh, the Sabbath is over, but they're still fearful of the, of the Jewish leaders. I guess, I mean, I understand that their leader had just been crucified and why wouldn't they be looking for his closest followers to stop the spread we know that they wanted to kill lazarus and now we get this strong indication that they wanted them to it, it, to finish the job mafia style as you call it they would have to take out more than jesus yeah i, I don't know what I feel and think about all that. Cause part of me is like, logically they'd have to, they were also very particular in the way of which they took out Jesus. And so I, yes. were they being pursued or was there just a the presumption they were being pursued? I, I don't know. Obviously the, the disciples felt that way. Now there was also two times this happened, right? Where they were inside a room with a locked door and Jesus came to them. The first time Thomas was not there. And the second time he was, is that accurate? Did I lose uh, you again? Can you say that again? There was two times when he showed up? Two times. So now there was two times where uh, they were in a locked room and Jesus showed up, right? Yes. And one time there's Thomas the first was there time. There's the first night when he says to them, um, a week later is when Thomas shows up and they're again in a locked room. So that's exactly right. And John tells these stories back to back. Like the first time Jesus shows up and he, he says, peace with you as in it's okay. And he shows them his hands and his side and they were overjoyed. And, um, he breathes on them, the Holy spirit. That is the weirdest line ever. <laughs> well, it makes sense, right? They have to receive the Holy Spirit. For sure. But then it but happens like, again later in Jerusalem. So why did yeah, they have I, to have it twice? 
like that that's where this story and i think that and you and i talked about this i think that um for me sometimes these are the moments why this story is so hard to interact with is because there yeah. is so much supernatural odd things happening that yeah i don't feel like for me it's less so for i think it's more your under your rationalizing the supernatural i don't want to say rationalizing mm -hmm. but we so you, so into the teleporting story. Jesus does not strike you as odd? Not at all. Huh. I, I guess because we never encountered that inside any of these stories of just some dude teleporting in and out of spaces and then breathing. It's not like, hey, you have the spirit now. Like, how did he breathe on them? Like, did, it, did he just exhale <laughs> well, through his nose? it says, he... receive the Holy Spirit. But it says he breathed on them, which right? Which is, again, I don't know. It's just there's so many mechanics to the supernatural of uh, – it's just – in. it's it's wild to read this stuff and really – I mean sometimes you, like, we see the, the actual how he performs a miracle and sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how he changes the water into wine. It just mm -hmm. happens. And those stories Whereas are others, for whatever reason – the ones where we don't see it are far easier for me to interact with. Okay, well, this, this. So you're hung up on the fact that he breathed the Holy Spirit into him. I don't know. Hung up. I find it just it stands out to me. And yeah. so a guy teleports in a room, breathes the Holy Spirit on them, and the we son talk about of like God, and, the Son of God teleports into a room and breathes the Holy Spirit on him. But also, like people right. kind of don't recognize him, and then they do. It's it's just what? wild. Like this is wild. Now I'm not trying to say that in a dismissive or critical posture. I'm just saying this is wild stuff. Well, I mean, it, it you're you are interacting with the divine. So right, we don't have a rule book for that. We don't have a playbook of how it happens. God always decides when and where to insert Himself into human history. It's his decision alone. So here's a decision of Jesus who is fully divine. Now, because we've kind of been focusing on his human nature, but here mm -hmm. he's fully divine and he shows himself as such by appearing in the middle of the room, mm -hmm. resurrected. Mm -hmm. so I like how you said, I mean, because you, you said that maybe in our prep for this is like, this is the moment where he was fully man, fully God. And it seems like now he's fully God. Yeah. And that humanity is gone. I think you're probably, you're probably right in the sense that, I mean, we see him eating. So he's eating. That's a human characteristic. He even has, he's hungry at one point, right? Like it's not just yeah. eating. He's like, I'm hungry. Do you have any fish? Right. Bring me the fish so we can have breakfast. But is he doing that to make them feel comfortable or does he need to as fully divine? But yeah, we're seeing a lot more of the divine side of Christ through mm -hmm. this part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Whereas before we were focusing a little more on how he's human and interacting with the apostles and other people. But yeah, he's fully divine and we're seeing that, which is not what we're, well, not what we're used to. Mm -mm. And yet, he appears to us as divine all the time when he interacts with our life and things happen that we rightfully attribute to our faith in God in his uh, providence of us and taking care of us. We rightly attribute something like this has got to be the hand of God. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just not written down in such a way it's so black and white. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Yeah, and that's – I think that's what's striking to me about these stories is what you said. Like these are the – one of the few moments where they are written down very clearly like this. And it's just – I mean I'm confused by it. And also clearly the disciples who were there were kind of confused by it because even think the second time he appeared and did this thing where he comes in, even Thomas is like, I'm not – what I'm not sure. And, and Jesus has to pr show him, right? Um, so even they were a little perplexed, like what is happening here? Like, this is weird guys. I, I love the fact that in the story, Thomas is with the disciples and they're like, Hey, we've seen the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Thomas says, Hey, I tell you what, unless I see his hands and see those nail marks and put, 
my finger into his side, my hand into his side. I will not believe. Right. Now, a week later, Jesus shows up and he says the same thing. Peace be with you. And he immediately says to Thomas, immediately, put your finger here, see my hands and reach in and feel my side. Stop doubting and believe. So Jesus knows what they've been thinking and saying and Mm -hmm. talking about, even when he's not with them. Well, and also thinking of the trauma of this, like if I get my story right, like you, let's go back to Lazarus. <clears throat> G, he, Jesus finds out Lazarus has died. I think he tells his disciples he's asleep and he's like, we need to go see them. And they're like, Hey, it's dangerous. You know, yeah. you don't, why do you want to go back there? And then Thomas is like, Just said, let's go. Whatever happens, happens. I'm here. Yeah. For if we have to, right? if I have to die for you. I'll die for so you. this is Thomas. This is not doubting Thomas. Thomas. This is resolute, strong, let's get it done, Thomas. Yeah. This sequence of events broke him. Right? Right. The man that's yeah, like, this if is I a die different with... Thomas. Right? And why wouldn't it be? You just saw, and, and I think that's also the thing that, that we can so easily glaze over because we know the result of this, of, of the trauma these people suffered of seeing their friend, their, their, their rabbi, their teacher, their Messiah die just how unsettling that would have been like nobody thinks clearly acts or behaves clearly when a loved one passes no less i've never had a loved one murdered in front of me tortured oh, right i mean that's a terrible. different thing and to your point he comes back and sure thomas no problem and it's not like this fearful thing of like if you doubt you're going to go to hell or whatever it's like cool i'll take care of you like if you need to do this to believe in me here I'm right here for you. I just like the thought that there's this span of time. I mean, Thomas comes in and he's all, you know, I don't want to say cocky, but he's all, I'm not going to believe. I, I'm mm-hmm. just not going to believe unless I can physically feel it, see him and physically feel it. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus shows up a week later and goes, hey, come over here. You're the one who said you had to do this. And his message was stop doubting and believe, but really his greater message is because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And of course, that's us. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, that that stood out to me when I read that, like kind of sh- like chills kind of came over me when I read that. Yeah. And like, I love the redemption that continuously happens. I mean, because we're about to get into my maybe my favorite story and probably my top three favorite stories in all scripture of where well, he makes them breakfast and restores Peter. Why don't you walk us through that story in the time we have left? Yeah. So, so cause well, I know unfortunately we've... we can't cover every, you know, he appears so many times up to 500 people at once. Uh, we can't cover them all, but this is a very beautiful story that, that you're connected yeah. to. Um, so I love this. So there, we're, we're now fast forward to this moment where they're fishing and they can't get any fish. And this person walks up from the shore and says, have you caught any fish? And they, again, they don't know who this person is. It's like, no, we haven't. And this person from the shore cast your nets on the other side, which if I remember right, is throws back to the first time he called his disciples. That's right. When they were on the boat. So it's like this this beautiful symmetry that exists inside like the story. full circle kind of right and jesus narrative. does this a lot right yeah. which is so yeah. cool that's some of the love stories like i just love it love it love it love it and and so then peter it's like oh my gosh that's jesus so he picks up his clothes swims to shore right yeah. and then he finds <laughs> Jumps jesus. out of the boat or whatever yeah which is so he peter jumped into the water like it's so peter like peter just all in and then not, but I love him. And he finds uh, Jesus with a bed of coals, right? So Jesus had already made this fire. He had already prepared for this moment. I mean, think about making a fire and let the coals cook, uh, uh, burn down so you can cook over them. That's, that's not five minutes, right? So he, he got the, the, the fuel for the fire. He, he cooked or he, he got the fire going, coals. It sounds like he already had, uh, had fish, but then he br- had them bring more fish. He makes his friends breakfast. Which and he has most- bread too, right? Okay. Fish and bread. bread. Too. Uh, again, a beautiful symmetry to this thing. And then he asked Peter th- three different ways. 
do you love me? Well, and I forget the exact order, but f- take care of my sheep, feed my lambs, essentially three feed times. Feed my lamb, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. So feed twice and take care of. And it, the perfect symmetry to the three times that Peter de- denied him. Yeah. He gave him the three times of I love you, right? Like, I think if there's one takeaway from Jesus in my mind that just shows his character through and through, it's that it's this guy that he's been with for years who's crazy, who's bonkers, who's unruly, who seems to overreact and doubt and be passionate. Um, And Jesus makes him breakfast and reminds him that he loves him three times. It's it's really... A beautiful love story, the whole thing. I think that's the big message of the entire uh, crucifixion and resurrection is the level of the the depth of his love. But then he singles out Peter, who is his friend and the leader of the apostles, singles him out to say, I love you. Uh, Wow. One, wouldn't that be great to have Jesus say that directly to you in that in such a way like if you love me do this and peter says i will do whatever whatever you need whatever you Mm -hmm. want yeah i i this is an exercise that i think you and i should do and i think our listeners should do is go write that question down get out your phone write the note pull out a note app write down a piece of paper sticky note put that somewhere and set a calendar reminder three months from now and go read that that. ask the question like do you love me or what's the what yeah yeah write write the question god do you love me or or whatever question you want to ask i think that's a beautiful thing come back and look at it a period of time later and read it and look at your life over the last Mm -hmm. few months and i know whenever i've done anything like that it's always like oh yeah you do you absolutely do I love that idea, like having something uh, to do with the story rather than leaving it again until next Easter, Mm -hmm. uh, thinking about how the story applies to your relationship with Christ. I mean, he loves us so much because we do not see and yet we believe. And so whenever we're looking for ways to bolster our our belief by writing things down and going back through the story and expressing our love for him, for what he did, I I think he finds that to be a a wonderful thing. All of heaven does because that's what he came for. And this story is so bigger than we sometimes can wrap our minds around to your point. But the more familiar we are with it, the more we read it, the more the details, they make sense, right? Mm -hmm. All these things had to happen in order for uh, his journey to be fulfilled and completed. Well, I would add one more thing. And I think doing this podcast with you has really illuminated this and reminded me of this. Of the more you read it and talk about it, talk about it with people who you like, who you care for. And not trying to prove your understanding. Talk about it like you would any other story, right? And I Mm -hmm. think that's where the bones get some meat on it. Um, Because I I think the whole idea that we use when two or more are gathered, right? There's there's many uh, uh, scriptural ideas around this, but I think own this and, and, and use it in your life to enrich and enhance your faith, become active in this process uh, with other people. And that's, you know, doing this podcast with you, that's what's really been illuminated with me. If there's one thing that I hope and wish people would do is find one, two, three, four people, your spouse, your child, a friend, it doesn't matter. And talk about these stories. Like just, I mean, you can go read a chapter. I, I believe that the value of it is to read the story Uh, understand the story as a story, look at everybody in it and their role in it, discuss that person, like what, uh, again, with somebody that you want to talk, who who wants to talk about it with you, um, so that you can really get a 360 point of view or 
a more complete understanding of these people and what they did. And that's why I really love following the story in order of how it happened, because I think when we trace it step by step, so much more is made evident to us about God's plan and Jesus's journey, which is what we need to bolster our faith. I mean, that's what we really count on. We, we need to know it's true and it's helpful to know it's true by reading the stories over and over and seeing God active in our life, in our own experience with Jesus. We're just like the disciples. We misunderstand. We don't necessarily get it all at once, but we have the beautiful ability to look back over the arc of our life and see how Jesus showed up. He appeared uh, in our life at various points and provided for us. So in that way, we're just like them. Absolutely. Well, this so, has been I, yeah. an, another great journey. Um, obviously, we're, we've talked a lot today and oddly feels like we haven't even scratched the surface of the story. <laughs> it is such a big story. Not every story about Jesus is so uh, intricate. There's some great stories about him that are a little easier to walk through. But I have to say, I'm so happy that we've done that. This whole, I'm, I'm glad we took this whole journey to Calvary together. And people can go on my website, sandylaws.com, and find a little companion booklet, a free booklet called uh, The Path of Jesus, uh, The Path of His Passion, where you can see where all of these things took place, a little bit more geographical information connecting the story with the places. So I hope people will go on online and uh Get that, download it for free, and also sign up for my email, which comes out every two weeks. So love to be on this journey together with you, Jeremiah, and thanks for your awesome insights, too. Really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. you inviting me along for this, and, and you keep asking me back, yeah. which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited. Uh, I hope people get a little bit uh, more knowledge or experience around this, as I did um, for this season. Um, yeah. And, and then ultimately we give our, we give moments to our creator to prove how much he loves us. And, and to thank him hmm. for what he did. Like, I don't think we could possibly thank him enough for what he did for us. It's, I, I it brings me to tears and it also makes me feel so, so grateful that I have a God hmm who would do something like this to save me and the people that I love and anybody in the world who wants that can have it. It's just, a, it's such a beautiful, amazing thought. So Absolutely. that's why this time of year is a great opportunity to pause and, and thank him for what he's mm. done. Mm. So, so awesome. thank you. And we you, will Sandy. hopefully we'll see you soon. Whatever's next. We'll, That'll, that will be what happens. Okay. Um, thank take you. Care. Take care. Bye. All right.